I've been asked today to speak about MIS uh, or less invasive deformity surgery. Charlie is a world expert in, in deformity surgery in general, so looking forward to comments and criticisms and the, the arrows to be slung. But I've got about 10 minutes to go through this quickly. Uh, here are my disclosures. So first of all, congratulations to the uh, fellows and residents. Uh, you are very lucky and you're in a very select group of people. You have an incredibly uh, in-demand and hard to acquire skill set. And we welcome you to the club of, of spinal surgeons. And, and this is a picture from last year. Uh, this is Rod Asgui and our course director. Uh, we're at dinner and we were able to do this in person uh, in 2019. Unfortunately, we're doing this virtually, which is has got some advantages, but a lot of disadvantages as well. So this is sort of the typical case. This is the, the issue we're up against. And how do you do this MIS? Uh, this is a case that was done T9 to the pelvis, uh, largely with PERC and MIS uh, T-LIF. And I, I think that's sort of like the kind of goal that we want to get you to if you're interested in doing MIS deformity surgeries. And if you look at what's out there right now, um, the, the field is growing. This is a, a Medline, a Medline or PubMed search showing that the, the body of literature has grown year on year, and many of the faculty have participated in this process of building up a literature to tell us about the, uh, the limitations of these approaches, the evolution of techniques, and I'll try to cover all of that very quickly, but why, why are people interested in this, right? So I th think if you look at what folks like Charlie Sanser do, I mean, doing deformity surgery is like summoning Everest. It's kind of like the hardest, biggest, baddest, uh, aspect of spinal surgery, if you will. So if you could get to that point with less destruction, that would be the goal. And this is a growth area. You can tell that from the growth of the population. This is from uh, Richard Deo's uh, paper, always indicting spine surgeons. But the growth of, of long segment fusion surgeries in older folks is increasing for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is the proven efficacy as well as the, the, the dying need to maintain functionality as your skeleton falls apart. But this is the problem. So if you go Google uh, in a search, if you will, you will actually get an automatic fill-in uh, of what people have been searching on. So if you type in, is scoliosis surgery, this is exactly what starts to come up. And none of this talks about how great it is. It's all about the horrible things. And here's a lady who has a this is like a post, right? I'm not perfect. No one is. I have screws and rods holding my spine together. I have scars. I've had pain and been through hell and back and become stronger because she's a spine fusion survivor, right? So she survived what folks uh, that are on this panel do for a living every day. So that's quite a compelling uh, statement, if you will, on an emotional level. So the advantages are obvious, right? If you talk about trying to reduce costs, here's a nice paper from Rick Fessler's group. If you talk about preventing PJK, I think that evidence is being developed. If you talk about clinical improvement, I think that there have been a num number of papers showing that works. If you talk about coronal correction or sagittal correction, we're starting to see what's being done with these newer techniques. Again, working off the, 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 the shoulders of giants who've been doing this stuff with open operations. I'm going to try to quickly cover three different facets of this topic. The first is the leveraging of advanced techniques uh, for more powerful correction. And this is sort of the du jour talk. Uh, the second is how you use technology uh, to do this. And the third is uh, how you apply the principles in general for the individual patient. So advanced techniques. So this is the typical talk. As Juan Uribe says, this is like the butterfly collection. Try to show your best work. This is a type of case I showed you, and how do you do that? Bringing in screws to rods, doing MIS T lift, and, and 10 minutes does not allow us to do justice to even this one technique. This is a paper I wrote on, on that type of poster approach. So I'm gonna quickly cover poster approaches, but there are limitations with this type of sort of uh, percutaneous T lift approach, which is that you really can't treat the really bad deformities in either plane, either coronal or sagittal. So bigger correction methods, things like MIS PSO, this was a sort of a mini open type of approach that allows you to go in and do a PSO without opening up all the spine, using a four rod technique off of fixation and then breaking the spine, getting correction in that way. And that shows uh, how you can get that achieved. And this was uh, published in JNS and you can look at that article and there are a couple of others that have been published. This, this, as you can see, gives you much better correction in both planes, uh, much more powerful technique, but also in some ways more morbid. You still get the morbidity of that PSO opening, the blood loss, the risk of nerve injury in that site and, and the tremendous instability present. Now, of course, this is where most people have headed. And this is, I, I know Rod and many others on the panel are experts in this, which is how do you do this through an anterolateral approach, whether it's uh, X-lift, D-lift, O-lift, A-lift, and whatnot. 
And the power of this is obvious. This is a simple case to show you how this is a standard open surgery. But if you look at this lady, she's terribly sagittally imbalanced. And just by correcting her, this is sort of the before and after. I'm sorry, it's a little little funny to look at. The before frames are the first and third from the left, and the, uh, the, the second and fourth are the post-op. By doing a relatively small surgery without going back through and working through her old Harrington rods, which she had had for 20 years, you can get a tremendous amount of correction from an a, uh, ALIF, A-L-I-F, right? Just at L5-S1, single segment. And this lady actually works in our hospital and I see her every week. And I can attest to the change from doing what is relatively a small surgery, right? But is this truly MIS, right? I would tell you that I think it is. I think for the type of job you're up against, this is different from taking down the fusion and trying to redo everything and doing say a PSO at L3. Uh, and there you can see the hyperlordotic cage being used in a simple technique. Of course, Louis Pimenta gets a lot of credit for re re rejuvenating the concept of lateral surgery, which has been around since the 1930s, uh, but doing it through an MIS approach, trans-SOAS, uh, pre-SOAS, or ATP, or however you want to call it. This is our ISSG group. Uh, Chris Shaffrey and Shea Bess and the group have been uh, leading the way with open surgery, but of course, they recognize the need for MIS. And here's a, a, one of many, many papers uh, in the ISSG group you can look at. This shows doing a hybrid surgery, which involves an open posture in red versus uh, circumferential MIS or a standalone lateral, what you can achieve. Uh, this is added lordosis. And the idea being, if you look at this, this shows you that you're trying to get the, the adequate amount of lordosis for the patient, that we're generally applying different techniques to different patients and getting the results you need. So in other words, some techniques are more powerful than others, right? And this is uh, the MIS def uh, algorithm. Praveen Mumanini gets credit for, for starting this out. There's an MIS def 2 now published in neurosurgery, or I'm sorry, Journal of Neurosurgery, looking at how you try to work through an algorithm to figure out what type of surgery we'll use for, for, for which patient. This is probably the most exciting area. If you haven't seen it as a trainee, you should definitely seek this out. This is the anterior column resection. This is cutting the ALL, releasing it. I know Jay Turner spent time with, um, with um, Greg Mundus and his group, uh, Bob Eastlack, looking at this. And so basically coming through the side, cutting the ALL if you don't have a previous fusion, and getting that correction tremendously like this. Here's a CT scan showing that correction at L23, getting a, a fairly harmonious looking type of a correction there. And so this is, uh, this is Wanda Rebase published uh, paper on this. He has numerous papers on this looking at the different kinds of osteotomies now taken through the MIS setting, so the Schwab grading, if you will, uh, through the different types, including now ACR instead of, of, of uh, VCR, right? So new technologies, okay, so this is more about making good surgeons better. So what if you say, well, I'm just not a super master surgeon, but I want to do these techniques. There are avenues for doing this, right? And so this was the first MIS a deformity I ever heard about. This was uh, from Greg Anderson from Philadelphia. And this is, this is so tr trivial now, but back then this was really a big deal. And I think if you look at guidance, image guidance, if you look at robotics, this really changes the way people can execute. The robots are gonna be a big part of the future. It takes away a significant piece of the difficulty in terms of what we have to do as spinal surgeons, right? And I always like to show this slide because think about the fact that you have two arms and four fingers. I'm sorry, sorry, 10 fingers, sorry. Four limbs, 10 fingers, 10 toes. The robot, here's a robot with four arms. And this shows a robot making a sandwich, right? It's very different when you have that ability and capability, right? And technology is attractive. You can deal with the abnormal anatomy. Uh, how do you work around smaller spaces? The planning, the three-dimensional visualization, reduction of floral exposure, getting better efficiency and reducing stress. The last part is about applying MIS principles. And I'm just going to show you a basic concept, which is how you think about the patient in a minimally disruptive way, okay? And this is about not poking the bear. You'll see lots of deformity patients that don't need a T10 to pelvis or T4 to pelvis, right? And this is from Tony Tenori. This is a great quote. The goal is not to make the, make the patient 18 years old again. The goal is to take them back to the day before they were crippled in pain. And so this is a classic example. This is a lady who has relatively minor deformity. A lot of guys saw her and said, you need to have this corrected. She has foraminal stenosis. We just do an endoscopic foraminal decompression at one level. It's going to buy her a lot of time. One day she might need more done, but this lets her live to fight another day. So this is the MIS principle in the thought process, not the execution in thinking about doing less 
uh, to the patient and then just fixing what hurts. Like in this case, just fusing one level doesn't look as pretty as a T10 to pelvis, but it gets the patient where they need to be, right? Min min minimization is a great strategy. You get less iatrogenic destabilization, less PJK, adjacent level disease. It lets you treat frail, older people. Let the patient live to fight another day, right? So in the end, the results with MIS surgery have to be measured against the gold standard, which is still open surgery. Uh, shameless plug for our nurse surgery podcast. Please tune on in. And uh, thank you very much, Rod and Jens, for having us here. That was really great, Mike. I appreciate it. Um, any questions from the pa panelists? Jim Harris there, so I got to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I have I have a question. Um, so that one case that you uh, presented with the perk screws above and below, and the PSO in the middle, with the PSO being you know, um, open. What is your success rate with the arthrodesis, you know, towards the top of the construct where, you know, the patient's at risk of getting PJK and you don't have good ability to get like perfect, you know, decortication? Yeah, that's a great question, Charlie. A very, very common question we get. Let me just add that the, when you do the PSO that way, you still get the same rate of non-union at the PSO site. So right. Larry Lenke's discussion about it, 10 years out, a quarter of the rods are broken or something like that. That is the same problem, right? We're not changing that aspect. Juan and I, uh, I don't know if Juan's on right now. We, we published a paper, BNI Miami, looking at the, people always said, well, okay, you got the inner body below, but what about T10 to T12 or L1 or even higher, right? And we looked at the data. I've been putting BMP off-label, putting in the facets or on the screw heads. One, I don't think even does that. And I'll tell you, we've had essentially no, no, no failures. I had a paper with Praveen years ago that we, we had some failures. Unfortunately, they were with the San Francisco group side, and I'm not indicting that. I'm just saying we, we have not seen that problem, and we, we've been waiting for that for 11 years now. We've been waiting for that. We're right. just not seeing it. I don't, I don't know why. Maybe the spine doesn't move. Maybe the soft tissue envelope's good enough. Um, that's, that's been my experience. Juan's on the call too, right? So Juan could comment as well. Yeah, I'm in here, Mike. Uh, yeah, we're watching the group of patients. Um, seeing some of them, obviously, screws loose on the proximal part, but it's not the rule, actually. You know, it's more deception of that group of patients. Um, but, um, you know, every time you do long instrumentations, T10 to iliac so far and everything, there is a lot of factors playing that, and even open is the same thing. Sounds good. 